again and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. The second issue we're talking about, well, take a look at the headline. Vision TV, once again, focus of controversy. This time, they aired a documentary by a Turkish author, and according to this article, he's argued in the past that Israel is exploiting the Holocaust to justify its actions and contends Darwinism is the root cause of terrorism. Now, the interesting thing is here, this author demonizes Israel, accuses them of all sorts of things that will that'll unfold as we talk about this, but this is not the first time apparently Vision TV has been implicated because some weeks ago something similar happened, but I would say in that case it was more overt. This was a Muslim extremist that was um, spewing poison against Israel and against Jews and hate in general. The big issue here is the TV station says, in this case with the Turkish author, they didn't realize this man had this as a background. To me, this is an example for everybody who is in the field of broadcasting. I mean, to have somebody come on and start spewing something against the nation and preaching hatred, that's one thing. But background checks becomes another. The station did not hold back in its profuse apologies for the first time it aired in a wrong way with this Muslim extremist. This time, however, they say, well, they didn't realize he had that in the background. Which brings us to the question, how many background checks are necessary? What onus does this put on broadcasters? And, on, I mean, I'm asking several questions here. I'm just throwing this out to you. But more importantly, these are the people that exist among us, and they're perpetrating hatred. They're a part and parcel of our society, which makes it very dangerous. It takes things like this to come out in the open for people to realize what is existing among us. What do you think about this? I'm well, going to start with you. Yeah, I think there's the moral issue and there's the legal issue. The legal issue for me is simple, even though it seems like it's in contrast with the moral issue. The legal issue is you own the station, you decide who gets broadcast yes. through your facilities, and yes. it's as simple as that. How many checks do you do? As many as you want to do. Um, uh, do you want to do any background checks? That's up to you. You own the station. How, and, the, and the government should not intervene. However, uh, morally, as a station owner, knowing that putting a person on the on your uh, you know system is going to not only potentially spread you know harmful falsehoods but also make your station look as though you are endorsing or somehow sanctioning the views of the person on your TV I mean in this case my understanding is that the actual programs weren't anti-semitic but that the people who were hosting them yes. Even if they were Although just in the weathermen. first case, it, it, there was a bit of um, discrepancy there. That man was just apparently overtly anti-Semitic. Right. This one apparently was not. I mean, I think the CEO of Vision TV said, you know... He apologized. He yeah, even sent oh, a letter absolutely. to the National Post apologizing publicly for it. He had, a good, he had a good analogy, though. He said, you know, would we let Ernst Zundel do the weather on our station? Of course not, because even though Zundel wouldn't be saying anything that's false, well, as far as weather can be predicted accurately... <laughs> <laughs> um, you wouldn't have him on because it would imply that Vision TV would somehow endorse the other views of Ernst Zundel. So but, but you know what? The Turkish author, I think, from my perspective, is a disgrace. But in terms of the station, it, it makes you wonder how many other stations do this. Perhaps when you consider how many programs get broadcast across Canada every year, how many people have gone on air with a hidden background or perhaps something in their background that the station just somehow did not get to. Vision TV is definitely being made an example of here, but it certainly calls in more accountability on behalf of broadcasters. Well, I, I, I agree with you that uh, broadcasters are, have to be accountable. I, I don't know if I agree with the division that you're making between the legal and the moral implications. I think that the legal system is supposed to protect us from, from immoral hate. things. From hate? So w w part of the laws that we have are protecting us from immoral things. Immoral things are illegal. If you're promoting something which is immoral, it should be illegal. And I think the government has that responsibility because Business, small and big business, have one thing in mind. That's the bottom line. And unfortunately, the only way to keep things in check sometimes is to have a system I understand. that follows up. So I think legality is unnecessary. And now, as far as their culpability, how, how much obligation, whether it's moral mm -hmm. or legal, mm -hmm. I think that when you're in broadcasting, you have a tremendous responsibility. We have yes. an ancient tradition yes. that says that the wise have to be very careful with the words they use. It's true. Lest later those words become exploited and cause a bitter end for somebody else. Hmm. If you're in broadcasting, you have a sacred obligation to protect the public. As you have a sacred opportunity to influence the opinions of people. 
And it's un incomprehensible to me why somebody couldn't do a Google check. I mean, it's so easy to do mm -hmm. searches today. You don't have to pay a private eye. You press a, a button, mm -hmm. and in, in 10 mm -hmm. minutes, you can have pages and pages and pages of information. Everything is so available. What are they talking about? If they would hire somebody, wouldn't they do a check like that? Normally, I would think so, yes. I would yeah. think so. I, I think vision is absolutely culpable, and the fact that when you mm -hmm. find the same thing happen only a few weeks later, how could they allow somebody to go on air on and the same speak? program, by on the way, Dildo Pakistan. Well, it's maybe Dildo Pakistan has got to be gotta at go the way of the dodo. I mean, Dodo, Dodo Pakistan. If, 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 if this is the kind of stuff that Dildo Pakistan is stuck with because they can't mm -hmm. find any other people for that program that have kind of a clean slate, well then, find yourself a new program. I find that often people on the altar of multiculturalism yes. are ready to sacrifice everything, yes. including coddling terrorists, mm -hmm. including going out of your way to, 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 to look mm -hmm. the other way in a way which people would never do in an incomprehensible way when you're facing evil. Mm -hmm. Well, it's multiculturalism. Now, it's interesting what you said, because in the article here, Anita Bromberg is quoted, and she's been a guest with us many times, and here's what she said. To have this many strikes against them in a short period of time is a testament to the difficulty, she says, of living in the world today where there are those who will use the cover of religion and multiculturalism to preach hate. She had a very valid point there, because... I mean, this is what fuels people. We were talking during the break about the likes of Christopher Hitchens, who talks about religion poisoning everything. Right. When you've got people using religion as a form of hate, you end up, they end up getting credence. And you give credence to these types of people to I condemn mean, religion. I don't know that every religion is a religion of peace. I, I'm not convinced. Okay? I, I don't know but that yet, every religion But morality and laws came from religion. Yes. That cannot yeah, be thrown it, it out of the door either. Certainly. I'm not saying we should throw religion out, though. That would Precisely. sound kind of funny for a rabbi to say. <laughs> I, I'm saying I'm not convinced that every religion mm -hmm. necessarily is, it promotes peace. And if it doesn't, then it doesn't have to be a good thing. Religion is not necessarily good because it's called religion. If, mm -hmm. if a religion is good, then it's good. If it's moral and it's peace-loving, not that it says it's peace-loving, but that it actually demonstrates that it looks for peace and it looks for inclusivity and it looks to create a moral code that can embrace all peoples mm -hmm. and doesn't have a fascist attitude to those who don't look at things like them, then it's good. Religion is not good because it's religion. I agree with that 100%. Yes. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it's not so much even religion. Religion isn't truly even the issue when we're talking about, you know, how far, uh, how far should things go before the state intervenes. I, to my mind, the issue mm -hmm. is when does uh, erroneous or irrational conduct uh, go beyond belief and into harmful action? When do you start, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when should the state intervene? In my code, my political code, it would be as soon as uh, somebody's irrational beliefs lead them to start depriving others of their, you know, their property, their liberty, their life. At that point, that's the role of the government. Step in pr and, and provide protection and if some harm occurs, uh, you know, do the remedial punishment. Uh, there's no Can I add that I think we have to add when we talk about harm? Mm -hmm. We're not only talking about tangible physical harm, we're talking about intimidation. But the two of you are talking, talking about, about psychological here, harm also. Yes. If, if, there's if there's a threat of physical harm, I would think so. Hurting, hurt feelings, on the other hand. No, I'm not talking about I, I, yes. We have to go for a break, but there's something essential here that I just want the two of you to make a quick comment about, and it was to do with the whole issue of separating morality from, from legal issues. There tends to be this drive, this movement that says you cannot legislate morality. However, when you look at um, thou shalt not kill, for example, by the Torah, we have that as part of our legal system. So where do you draw that line? Uh, this has been are full of morality. This has been a huge issue that's been debated by those who were talking talking about their version of separating church and state, it's yeah. loaded. Law, law is the encoding of a morality or several or a mangled uh, group of moralities. Yes, it is, but that's not being recognized by certain groups. That's pushing correct. Pushing otherwise. And, and uh, to my mind, the, the dividing line is, is um, the physical and the, and the natural versus the mystical, which the government should be taking into account. But then the psychological, decisions. as you mentioned, ends up being a little bit of a well, fuzzy... We talk about life. Life is something which is not natural. It's, so there's something more than... than we'll than have to disagree on that. <laughs> Whoa. Topic for another show. We're going to go for a break then when we come back. Well, BC is implementing a pilot project. About, it's about emergency rooms. We'll tell you about it after this. It could change the way we do things in Canada. Stay tuned.